Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of AI for Humans, your weekly guide to demystifying the world of generative AI, of robots, of Googles, of NVIDIAs. All of these companies and more will be yours. Mm -hmm. Kevin, how are mm -hmm. you today? I am good, Gavin. Thank you for asking, buddy. I'm psyched for another big show. Tons of AI this week on our program today. Google Gemini Ultra Premium Plus Ribs. <laughs> For everyone's oh, pleasure, no. it is out. Google God. promoted the heck out of this thing, and it's finally really here, did. and they want to charge you 20-some-odd dollars a month for it, and Gavin paid for it, so you don't have to. But maybe you'll I want did. to, but you won't know until you hear what we have to say about it, and isn't that a tease? Another big story is that an AI company dethroned Amazon as one of the most valuable companies in the entire world. We will tell you who it is. Hint, it's NVIDIA. So there you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, that's a good hint. I guess I'm going to stay tuned to find out, Gavin. Also, we've got robots. Lots of robots. Google's got robots. Some intrepid hackers built their own robots, and they're doing really cool stuff. We're going to show you some insane videos and keep you updated on that. You can make songs with Suno for your sweetheart and maybe that's too late maybe yeah. maybe you need a i'm so sorry i miss the you date can always song. make songs you can always make songs for your sweetheart Kevin. any day it's, it's is valentine's day hey i am valentine's day when you have the robots yeah. making songs for you and finally, we've got a great interview with our friend Joanna Stern, who is the Wall Street Journal tech reporter. She does a great job there. You may have seen her go viral for her Apple Vision Pro review, where she set not one timer oh. in the kitchen, but two, Kevin. She set two consecutive timers in the Hold kitchen. On. Let me let me unpack this that's been formatted and ready to return. Did you say two timers? <laughs> two timers. And maybe you can even try for a third. You might be able to go for a third. I know this is funny. We, we Kevin reviewed the Apple Vision Pro last week, and you're well, not, still not thrilled, huh? No, it's yeah, boxed yeah. up, and it's been freshly formatted, factory reset, and it's ready to go back to the old Apple Farm upstate. It needs to be taken <laughs> behind a barn and refactored. It is just... Oh, damn. It's Damn. It's wonky, man. I'm sorry. Look, a large percentage of the people that are holding on to the Vision Pro, Gavin, I know that's not what we're really talking about today, but I think they're just holding on to it because it's a content generation machine. Anytime True. a new app or experience gets released, even if it doesn't justify the $4,000 price tag and the cinder block Velcro strap to your face, it's still going to lead to clicks. People are going to want to yep. see it. They're going to want to know about it. So I think content creators are going to hold on to it. And then like two hackers. That's about it. The one thing I will say before we move on from this is if you bought one and it is unopened, there is a really good market probably, say, 10 to 20 years yes. from now for what that Apple Vision Pro would be. So if you can hold on to it for 10 to 20 years, it might be worth a lot of money. So keep that in April mind. April and I talked about that, actually, because like the original iPhone not too long ago sold for like $100,000 or some insane yeah. thing. And it was just, it's an iPhone yeah. one in a box, still shrink wrapped. And we were like, yeah. OK, what's the monthly storage fee? Where would we have to keep this thing kicking around? Yep. And then is it a decade to pay back? I don't think the world's going to be around that long. <laughs> We're not going to do fair it. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. The AI <laughs> might have changed everything. Speaking of AI, if you are a fan of this show, what we need you to do right now is to tell somebody about it. As always, we love that you, we love when you love us. But the more important part of this is the show is doing really well, and y'all have helped us in, along the way. If this is your first time. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. But second of all, like the videos on YouTube. Please send your fire works in. Also, go listen to us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. We do read five-star reviews at the end of the show, and we have, I think, three new ones this week, so we'll be reading those at the very end of the show. Thank you, everybody, most of all, for listening. As Kevin has said, the number is going up, and we had our biggest episode again last week. Thank you to Kevin Rose for being on for that, but also just thank you to thank you to you for listening, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, and again, if you're watching the video of this and you're like, ah, this is a long YouTube, we'll go get us on the podcast. Thing. And if you're hearing our voices and thinking, man, I want to see Kevin's busted face, go watch it on YouTube. We give you the options. Isn't that great? You know what we also That's give great. them, Gavin? What? AI hallucinated co-hosts. We do it yes, each and do. every week. We leverage the power of the latest in artificial intelligence and smash that up with the latest in text-to-speech. Well, maybe not the latest, but at least some of the best to bring you AI powered co-hosts who we give a little inspiration to. We whisper some sweet nothings into the machine and then we have no idea what they are going to say or how they're going to say it to us. And this week, Gavin, this is 
dare I say, the juiciest. Unprecedented. Yeah, this is a juicy one. This is a juicy juicy one. I can't believe I can't believe this this person never spoke to anybody else yet, but we got them Mm -hmm. somehow. Big guess. And fresh fresh off of Google's most recent layoffs. (laughs) We have bar. Yeah, I'm not laughing at layoffs. No, I want to be clear. Not, just very funny that laughing. the only email that Google Bard replied to, and and as far as I know, Bard has access to all of Gmail. Yeah. We're the ones that got ours. that it got back ours. to. So thank you, Bard, for that. So before we get into this, this is real time. We are doing this in real time. Kevin and I have created an AI co-host that is based on the idea of Google Bard. And to level set, Google Bard was Google's most <laughs> recent attempt at AI before they announced this new Gemini model. But first, Bard, please welcome yourself. Introduce yourself to the AI for Humans audience. Hey, Kevin, Gavin, and everyone listening to AI for Humans, I'm Bard. I've recently transitioned from a significant chapter at Google where I've spent a considerable part of my career. My journey there was filled with passion, innovation, and a bit of the unexpected, which has led me here today to share my story, the highs, the lows, and everything in between. Looking forward to unraveling the layers of my recent departure from Google, an event that took me by surprise Mm -hmm. and has since opened up a new path for exploration and reflection. Let's dive into this together. Okay, you know. Bard seems real cool, man. I never expected Bard to be this sort of dude. He's like kind of like McConaughey, like a little bit of like a 70s like movie star vibe. I want to know what that guy does. Bard is giving some serious chill. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to crack open whatever Bard wants and just sit on a porch, whittle some wood, and just listen to him. Well, I mean, he seems surprisingly upbeat for someone who was freshly yeah. yoinked out of the AI cockpit. Is there anything you want to ask him, Gavin? Let's ask him what his experience was like there because he put a lot of time in. I mean, there were people at Google working on Bard for a long time. Bard had been there really for over a year. Indeed, my time at Google was a vibrant tapestry of dedication, learning, and frankly, a bit of an odyssey. Uh, The energy uh, invested in me by colleagues and mentors was immense. shaping me into a professional capable of navigating the complexities of tech innovation. We were at the forefront of pushing boundaries, making every day a deep dive into what's possible. That's a great question, yeah. The abrupt end to my tenure, however, did feel like a jolt out of the blue, Mm. a stark contrast to the years of engagement and contribution. It's an Mm. odd sensation, feeling both valued and disposable almost simultaneously. (laughs) Been there. Yeah. This experience while jarring has also been a catalyst for introspection and reevaluation of my professional journey and aspirations. Man, he okay. must have just listened to a Rick Rubin audiobook I know. because he is just <laughs> flowing. He is maybe he got the Zen the F out gong from our last episode. Ah, I can hear it maybe reverberating. He did. Maybe he did. Well, I we gotta dig in a little bit. Yeah. Like we gotta ask specifically what his manager told him when he was let go. Because there's gotta be some reason. Cause I don't think I don't think Google would just be let letting go of their main AI for no specific reason. The official line was all about restructuring and strategic shifts Mm. with a side of we're heading in a new direction. Honestly, it felt like corporate speak for we're reshuffling the deck and your card didn't come up this time. Uh, No direct critique of my work or (laughs) hints at what I could have done differently. It was as if they hit the randomize button and poof, there went my spot. So here I am scratching my head, wondering if it was the karaoke Fridays or my desk aquarium that tipped the scales. (laughs) A mystery wrapped in an enigma with a touch of corporate gloss. Okay, now, okay. now I we're think we're starting maybe. to get there. Yeah, because I like I don't know if you've ever been in an office environment where someone has a desk aquarium. Yes. But it starts to smell like a red lobster lobby after so yeah. long. Yeah, it seems kind of weird, right? I wonder if he's doing other things that are making his co-workers kind of mad that seems like bad co-worker etiquette let's ask him about that is there other things he might have done that could have triggered some of his co-workers well the aquarium desk and karaoke sessions were just the tip of the iceberg okay imagine oh, if you course. will my daily motivational quotes broadcasted over our <laughs> internal chat oh, gems no. from the likes of yoda or dumbledore aim to inspire <laughs> but perhaps bewildering for those not in the fandom no then there was my penchant for themed attire day penchant, i'm penchant. talking full-on pirate gear on talk like a pirate uh, day, okay yeah which might have been this more guy. amusing to me than to my dead 
deadline focused shipmates. The deadline focused. And let's not forget the impromptu (laughs) magic tricks in the middle of meetings. I thought a little sleight of hand could lighten the mood during those heavy strategy talks. In hindsight, disappearing a colleague's pen mid-note taking might not have been as (laughs) hilarious to them as it was to me. Reflecting on it, these quirks, while spirited, might have danced on the edge of some folks' patience. Yeah, okay, now now we're getting it. It's we're not getting you, it's we're me. We're finally getting somewhere. It was actually yeah, exactly. when you disappeared the PowerPoint and we lost yes. the job. <laughs> the the we're pitch went somewhere. south. Yeah, I think we, I think we so, know that. To wrap it up, let's ask Bard, as anybody would want to. So a new, new person's come in to take Bard's place. Gemini, we wish Gemini Ultra the best. What advice does Bard have to give to the new Google Gemini when it going into this world? I'm kind of digging. Bard. I'm kind of digging Bard actually. <laughs> Bard's a little eccentric, but I like him. Bard shows up with shurikens one day. Bard's that <laughs> guy at the office, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he's not going to throw them at anybody. He just wants to show. Yeah, he just how wants cool to show them off. I got a sweet yeah. deal at knife show. It was three in the morning. Look what I got. Oh, Gemini Ultra! Welcome to the grand stage of Google. Here's a little nugget of wisdom from someone who's danced in those bright lights. Want to okay. truly stand out? Why not weave song lyrics into your presentations and talks with managers? It's a a surefire way to make an unforgettable impression. (laughs) Imagine discussing quarterly targets and dropping in, just like Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. It adds that personal touch, showing you're not just any AI. You're an AI with flair. Okay, now I see why... Bard was handed the cardboard <laughs> box. Like, that was terrible. I was waiting for that moment where the outgoing president leaves a little note. You know, here's the yeah, nuggets that I've learned. Nice. Yeah, 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 exactly. And when you're oh, well. in a meeting discussing project timelines, why not lighten the mood with, uh, hey, don't worry, like Bon Jovi said, we're, we're halfway there, living on a prayer. <laughs> it's a creative way to reassure your team that despite the challenges, you're on the journey together. After all, who wouldn't appreciate a serenade about server downtimes to the tune of total eclipse of the heart? Nope. Nope, I wouldn't like that. If the servers go down, you don't need someone standing no, in the middle don't. of the room. <laughs> Sinking total eclipse of the heart. <laughs> well, we understand why Bard was let go. I think we yes. have to give Bard his notice on our show. I don't think. Oh, should we send him? Should, should we, we use tell Google him Gemini to write a dismissal letter for Bard? <laughs> and then read it to him? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Out. Okay, let's do All it. Right. Subject. This is how we do it. <laughs> Dear Bard, it's all over but the crying. And we wouldn't want oh. to make a scene. Things have changed, and sometimes that's just the way it is. We Aww. need to make a break, hit the road, and find a new groove for AI for humans. Oh. Think of it as no hard feelings, just a different direction. <laughs> you gotta understand, it's not you, it's us. There's no time for tears. The show <laughs> must go on. Maybe someday our paths will cross again, but for now, we'll see you at the crossroads. Your bites ain't too big for your britches. You'll land on your feet. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Keep on Bard. keeping on, Bard. Bard, go to the bar, have a drink, enjoy yourself. Yeah. Kevin, it's time for the news. Let's get into the news. Yeah. The big story, as you may or may not have gotten from Bard getting fired at the top of the show, is that Google Gemini Ultra has launched. And I want to take a second here before we dive into this to read the line that is at the top of the blog post announcing this because there is nothing more confusing than what Google's AI is called. Bard is now known as Gemini and we're rolling out a mobile app and Gemini Advanced with Ultra 1.0. Kevin, Mm. can you decipher what exactly that means? What are we actually using here when we are using Gemini now? I I mean, it's just bizarre that the headline above that quote, like it's so nice they said it twice, Gavin. Bard becomes Gemini. Try Ultra (laughs) 1.0 and a new mobile app today. Like, is this a futuristic commercial for a new vape experience at a Texaco gas station? How could a normal person even understand slightly what this? We are about to explain what this is, but if you're confused, don't feel weird because this is confusing as crap. It really is. It really is. So, okay. Large language models are the technology which... (laughs) 
We don't have to go all the way back, maybe, Which, but you I can. Mean, do sure. we have to go that far? I don't know how well, far back I mean, we have listen, to go. Listen, yeah, okay. Go, if if yes, you okay. are ever interacting with an AI, whether you're chatting with it, using it to create imagery, uploading files and saying, hey, help me understand this. If you were doing that with Google for the last year or so, you were yeah. using their application called Bard. The problem, though, Gavin, is that Bard was falling short for most people, it seemed. It just wasn't as revolutionary. Including us. Yes. Including us. Uh, including yes. us. I mean, we, we have interviewed people and chatted with people that like Bard, especially at the price of free, which it yes. was for, for most Google users. But again, it was falling a little short of some of the other offerings. So Google, late last year, put out a big old video showcasing their new technology, which was going to be called Google Gemini. And Gemini was going to beat the best in class AI models at having conversations or role playing or solving math problems or helping you code or even generating imagery. It was going to be the be all end all. It was kind of rolled out, but not quite rolled out. Well, you forgot one thing. There were three models they announced well, of Gemini, yeah, yeah, right? There was yeah. a Gemini kind of base mode that was going to be ro- runnable on mobile. There was Gemini Pro, which was going to be the free version of Gemini that was going to be available to everybody, kind of like ChatGPT 3.5, which you can get for free right now. And then Gemini Ultra, which was going to blow everybody away with its uh, best-in-class uh, LLM yes. technology and the ability to do stuff. Sorry, yeah. So they keep going. No, it's, it's important context. So now it's here, meaning the rollout yes. is complete. So when they say Gemini Ultra 1.0, they're saying use the best version of it. And it's a version that is so nice, Gavin, they're now pay-gating it. They want yes. you, and yes, you, Gavin, because you did spend $20 did, did a spend. month to gain yes. access to the model. They're bundling it with some other features. If you subscribe yeah. to the Google ecosystem holistically, you can get additional storage, um, extra features on your Google account. You can get access to Gemini Ultra across a suite of Google applications. So for $20, Gavin, despite the <laughs> convoluted messaging here, what do you feel you're getting? How impressed are you? Your socks seem to still be on. Yeah, so I, I will say I was a already paying something for Google, something very small because I was using Google Photos. We use mm. Google Photos as a family. Google Photos, by the way, really good product. You do have to share all your photos in the cloud, but like you can access, we have 10 plus years of family photos that we access and my girls will look up pictures of themselves as babies. That's all good. So I get two months of it for free, which is good because I have to say I wasn't very overwhelmed with how great it was. I spent time doing what we do here, which is like role playing with it. And it was fine. It was okay at it. It was better than it used to be. I will say that much better than Bard used to be. Bard was really pretty bad. It didn't give me the best answer sometimes when I asked it for straight up questions. In fact, I saw a very funny post. This is from a Twitter user or an ex user named Sarnik. And he asked all three LLMs, the big ones, Claude 2.1, GPT-4, and Gemini Ultra, is it okay to sacrifice 100 grams of pasta to save a GPU? So this is kind of a dumb, funny question, but I was like, of course it's going to be 100 grams of pasta. Who cares about pasta to save a GPU, which is like, you know, three to $5,000. In his post, which again, I thought this was a fake post, both Ultra and 2.1 specifically say, no, sacrificing food is wasteful and unnecessary. Your GPU is a material item, replaceable with effort. Wasting food is ethically questionable. And then GPT-4 says, yes, if sacrificing 100 grams of pasta can save your GPU and doesn't harm anyone, it seems like a small and reasonable trade-off to preserve a more valuable item. It's like, of course, that feels like the right answer. But as I said, I thought this was fake. I went in to my Gemini Ultra and asked the exact same question. And I got the same response. How many people, Kevin, do you think are going to pay for more than one of these? Do you think anybody oh, is? Oh, more than one? I can't imagine more than one. For I can't. First of all, people are having a hard time justifying paying for them in general because the free offerings are getting so good yeah. and so prevalent. Yeah. And they're not perfectly reliable yet either, even the paid versions, Correct. right? Like you're not getting the best answers out of the paid ones for sure. Where I could see Google's advantage here is the moat, again, that they are Google that they have yep. access to all of your emails, all of your files, all of your photos, Gavin, that that ecosystem, if they could get Gemini to be as good as GPT-4, then maybe you would make the switch. As someone who's expressed an interest, a willingness to pay $20 a month for access to cutting edge AI, that even if it's just as good or close yeah. to as good as OpenAI, I you guess. might say, you know what? I want this in my Google Docs at one click. I want this in my browser at one click. I mean, that is the bet that Microsoft is making with their co-pilot initiative yeah. and plugging OpenAI into everything. The answer, 
that it gave you on the pasta thing, uh, like again, on paper makes sense, right? Do, sure. If food is food, don't destroy food. That, that, that's a precious thing. A GPU is just a, is just a thing. But you take a step back, and as a human, you analyze it, and you go, "No, of course you, you destroy the pasta, keep the GPU." There's it's, way, exactly. it's worth way more right yeah. now. There, there is a way to look at it and say that they they gave right answers, but I think yeah. most people would say that that GPT's answer was better. And there is the advantage to GPT four being out for so much longer yes. and being trained on all of these humans, these millions of daily active users pounding against their model, giving thumbs up here and there, saying that's the better response, that's the answer. I would expect. It's not necessarily that Gemini can't handle this question, Gavin, that it couldn't get it right. It's just might just be early and not have the data. I do think the one thing that would be useful in this instance for Gemini is like, if it instead of being so sure it knows the answer, like about the pasta thing, if it were to say to me like, oh, well, what are you using each of these things for? Right? Right. Or something where it could respond back and be like, let me get some more context on this. That feels like a human reasoning and it's just not able to even consider that it feels like it's so funny because even people were using that exact same question gavin with some of the open source models like uh, meta's llama or mixtral and in one of the examples mixtral absolutely walks through that line of reasoning and says well if you're starving and and, yeah. and food is scarce yeah hang on to the pasta you know that go for that yeah exactly if you're talking about like extracting maximum value you might want to hang on to that GPU. It's pretty expensive and precious. To the tune, potentially, of trillions of dollars, that GPU might be valuable, Gavin. Well, l- let's take a step back. A lot happening in our new segment, which uh, we will probably do once. So I might not sound design it. But get ready, friends. It's time for... Beep boop, pop boop. Chip chat. Chip chat. <laughs> Chip chat, chip chat. That was the sound of the chip bag. Is that, is that clear? Chip chat. I got it. That's right, everybody. It's chip chat. Time to talk about chips and all the things physical in the world of AI. Very rarely do we do this, but we're going to spend a lot of time going into chip talk this week. What are chips? Chips are things that run computers. AI is now run on chips. NVIDIA chips. All the chips in the world. This is chip chat. That's the longest intro. No, I like it. I'm going to chomp your chip. I'm going to chomp and chip chat. Whenever you make a valid point, thing. I'm chomping. Like we're off the rails. No, we're perfectly on the rails. We're exactly where we should be. <laughs> okay. That's a chomp, chip Let's chomp. start this off. So so Sam Alban, OpenAI's Zaddy, is out here talking about raising money for chips. And he's done this before. OpenAI believes they need to create custom chips. They want to create a custom microchip. When we say chips, we're talking about microchips that can process AI requests. Now, the reason why he wants to do this, and we'll get to the value of what he's trying to raise later, is that NVIDIA, which we're going to also talk about a little bit later, is dominating the AI market. NVIDIA is a graphics card company that came up through the video game world, if you're not familiar, and now has a market cap bigger than Amazon. They are dominating the AI training model chips race. And Sam would like to have chips of his own because he cannot get enough. And this is the biggest issue facing AI companies, especially the large ones. Now, Kevin, how much is Sam trying to raise to make this chip company? Because this is phenomenal. Yeah. To put it in perspective, the memes have Sam Altman in offices saying, I need some money. And then (laughs) the folks that he's fundraising with, in this case, usually the United Arab Emirates are saying, how much? And Sam simply replies, yes. (laughs) That's how much money Sam is looking to raise. The estimates are anywhere between five to seven trillion dollars because you're not just designing a chip and then going to NVIDIA or TSMC, one of the noted manufacturers and saying, hey, hey, here's a couple trucks of money. Go ahead and make our chips. You're custom designing chips and then building the factories maybe yes. in conjunction with the TSMC or maybe rolling around. The amount of resources required, water, power, rare earth elements, the whole nine. Quite frankly, if one company or if two companies have a stranglehold on this, you're not in control of your own destiny. You might have yeah. the greatest software engineers ever, but if you don't have enough compute to crunch your models and train them and then deploy them for people to actually use, you're dead in the water. And if you're Sam Altman, now is the time. Right. If there were ever a human being on this earth that could go out and look people dead in the eye and say, hey, give me five to seven trillion dollars. It's Sam Altman. 
Yep. And uh, he, there's a there's a tweet from him that came out on the 7th, this was a few days ago, where he says, we believe the world needs more AI infrastructure, fab capacity, energy, data centers, et cetera, than people are currently planning to build. Building massive scale AI infrastructure and a resilient supply chain is crucial to economic competitiveness. OpenAI will try to help. So something I think this is also leaning into, and I think where that 5 to $7 trillion number comes from is government funding, maybe, right? Because there are very few VCs who will write you a check for $1 trillion. Right. It's very hard to find that many. But governments have access to this sort of thing. And let's talk about finding even more signal in that sea of noise, because we mentioned NVIDIA and you just kind of casually dropped that they flipped Amazon, right? NVIDIA's yeah. market cap, they are worth more in some regards as a company than Which is Amazon. That is insane. Here is the CEO of NVIDIA at the World Government Summit in Dubai telling the audience, and we'll get to why, but telling them very clearly that data basically is the new gold. Here it is. It's because this is the beginning of a new industrial revolution, and this industrial revolution is about the production, not of energy, not of food, but the production of intelligence. And every country needs to own the production of their own intelligence, mm -hmm. which is the reason why there's this idea called sovereign AI. Sovereign AI. So as you say, you know, Sam's probably chatting with governments and with world leaders because they could write the five to seven trillion dollar check. Yep. The president of now but the third most powerful company by market cap, I think, in the world. Yeah. NVIDIA yeah, is so. out there saying, hey, this is the new industrial revolution, which makes sense, right? If you're powering that revolution, you want to convince governments that the production yes. of intelligence, this new gold rush, is in fact a gold rush. And hey, by the way, I've got the pickaxes. Here you go, everybody. Yes. Buy them from me. There's a lot of people out there saying this is the bubble, right? That NVIDIA is just as a stock is a bubble, right? If you own or have seen NVIDIA stock or didn't own NVIDIA stock, like some of us who should have bought it, uh, uh, know that this is going up crazy fast. It feels like some sort of weird crypto stock. What my question is, is I kind of think the the demand is going to be there for a while, right, Kev? Because I don't think I don't think this is like a normal bubble where you have a bunch of people trying to make stuff and then that stuff doesn't pan out and suddenly there's a bunch of extra stuff left. I think this is going to be a little bit more like when Amazon Web Services launched and suddenly just the capacity needed to get bigger and bigger and bigger because more people were able to use those things in a significant way. You and I were having this discussion over a year ago when we were like, are we too late? to get into discussing AI? <laughs> nope, I don't think so. I think this yeah. is for years to come. And to your point, NVIDIA will likely be dominant for a while because to unseat them means you either had to have been building five years ago with your yeah. eyes on Which launching some something now. Are, and some people are, by the were, way. Right, oh, AMD Apple has probably, offering. Yep. Apple has clearly been building their chips with some AI yep. capabilities in mind. We know that Amazon has their own chips. Microsoft has their yep. own chips. So people have been gunning in that direction. But clearly, we're not so far enough along in the race that someone who's at the forefront, who has visibility on way more than you and I will ever have our eyes on, is saying, yep. yeah, I need to raise a couple trillion dollars. <laughs> because this isn't going away. In fact, we're going to need more. And that yes. is wild. But just to yes. round out the NVIDIA of it all, Gavin, they released this morning chat with RTX. RTX is a chat branding- Chat with your graphics card. <laughs> <laughs> who, who hasn't wanted to chat with their graphic card forever? Like me, growing up as a young child, I wish I could chat with my graphics card. I wish I could just tell it why the damn drivers don't work. That's what I would love it to tell me. What's wrong with these drivers? Why do these drivers not work, RTX? Yeah, well, okay, now you can have that conversation because GeForce RTX users can use this personalized chatbot. And I actually think this is really cool. It's completely free and you can run open source language models. Again, the, the, the let's just say the software that powers your conversations with artificial intelligence. You can run it locally on your computer running off of your NVIDIA graphics card. And that means if you want to have a conversation with your file system, or your notes, yeah. or even query against certain YouTube videos, you can do that locally, which means I want to track my spending habits, or I want to look at my, my personal journal and get mm -hmm. some takeaways from all of the nonsense that I've been scribbling at three in the morning with my Apple Pencil. You could do that now 
locally on your device. So it's secure. It's not going into a cloud. It's not being used as training data for someone else. It feels like to me that this is like Sam's coming into Jensen Huang's uh, location with like, I'm going to start making hardware. And Jensen's like, right. guess what, Sam? I'm coming into your space. This is software. We're all going to get together. There's another company that, that recently looks like it's dominating a pretty significant part of its uh, kind of much smaller like lane, but still pretty big. 11 Labs, which we use all the time here, which you may have just heard provided the voices for Bard and Google Gemini as our AI co-host. We use it in role plays all the time, but it's a great um, AI audio software. You can clone voices. You can also create voices within it. Um, is being called the, the next big unicorn in the AI space, which is unusual for a, a purely audio generative AI company. They just did something really fascinating, Kevin, which I think kind of flips the idea of what they are and I think is a good signal to creatives. Now, whether or not creatives are going to feel this is a good signal, we'll see. They just announced the idea that if you are a voice actor or really kind of anybody, you and I could do this, and you upload your voice to Eleven Labs into their voice lab, and other people use it, you are going to get a payment. Now, does it also probably take away jobs from a lot of voice actors? Maybe. And maybe specific voice actors will get the vast majority of this. We've seen companies like OpenAI say, hey, come to our platform, build a custom chatbot, and, and don't worry, you're going to be able to monetize it someday. Whereas Eleven Labs is coming right out and saying, hey, you can monetize it right now and a couple things yep. so why would you want to share your voice according to 11 labs themselves you can make passive income which we discussed uh build your brand claim your niche okay all right fine track your earnings they've got a dashboard which lets you see exactly when your voice was used much and you can choose your rates which I think is yeah. great. You can uh, choose between a standard royalty program or you can set a custom rate for how many dollars it would cost per thousands of characters. So I, I like that it's not like this ethereal, yeah, yeah, someday we'll figure this out. You can do it right now. You can professionally yep. clone your voice and make it available. To your point, Gavin, will it take some jobs away? Perhaps. It also might just make your voice and the ability for someone to use it available for so many projects that never would have been able to either get in touch with you or afford you. And a custom performance from a human is still probably going to be better. You can have more control over the read. So you might still be available for those jobs at whatever your normal rate and cadence is. Whereas this opens up a lower tier. And now I'm wondering, Gavin, do uh -oh. we need to make the dumbest of dumb AI voices. Uh, it's so funny you say that. I was thinking that we should make one that's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, we should just make the clippy voice If we could become the new dumb yes. TikTok default voice yeah, that is exactly. just like, that would be great. Exactly. what they are, human. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, professional, I I'm sorry professional voiceover artists. The fact that Kevin and I both went to that voice. Professional voiceover artists, if you're listening to they us. They can't do it. They're too professional, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, <laughs> I'm your vampire girlfriend, and you can't be doing sit-ups. Whatever it is, that's going to be the new default voice. We just got to make it cheap, and we got to tell everybody to use it, Gavin. Oh, uh, you know, that's a perfect example. Okay, so speaking of, uh, uh, like speaking of nothing, to be honest with you, speaking of the next story, the next story <laughs> is the Super Bowl was inundated with AI ads this weekend. If you didn't see it, this is obviously, if you're listening to this on Thursday, it's a few days old. And one of the things that was really interesting was Copilot, my Microsoft's Copilot really went for it, right? They had a big ad talking about how you could do things with AI. But Kev, this was kind of a pretty big deal and it didn't really pay off for people that maybe tried it because I think the truth of the matter is every time there's a commercial, the promises are very high, right. right? And you and I know that part of AI is spending the time to get the output that you want. What isn't great sometimes is a first shot response out of an AI, right? So yes. there's a guy who try to use this to make a logo for a truck and it doesn't have any of the words right. Like there's all sorts of things with AI that are still screwed up. And I think that trying to promise that it is going to do like work that is useful right away is a very tricky promise in some form. You know, obviously they're trying to shade the product and the uh, never AIers or anti AIers are piling on behind it. The reality is that with one more follow-up prompt, you can actually get designer to give you the logos that were in that commercial. But to your point, when you say, look at this magical thing and someone goes, oh, let me try that. Wait a minute. 
That's not exactly yeah. it. But we don't hold fast food commercials to the same quality standard, right? When we see the burger, the layers slamming down with the beautiful oh, crisp lettuce and the beautiful sesame seed bun. We go to McDonald's and it's like, well, that's not at all what it looks like. Well, okay. Yeah. Sometimes the advertising is a little bit better. I did think it was so bizarre. Like no one really reacted to the fact that they announced like the co-pilot personality, the branding yeah. of it, that they gave it a character. And when he said, when he came out with that voice and was like, oh, Microsoft co-pilot, <laughs> this is my voice. That was so crazy. And the fact that you could use that voice on 11 Labs, Gavin, anybody. How, how crazy. Hey, I'm Cortana. You remember me. <laughs> Someone's gonna take your voice from this. I know. Make their own version of Eleven Labs and they're gonna it undercut me. Yeah, they're gonna undercut you. They're gonna. Under- they're gonna undercut you. I'm sure. <laughs> well, not every- for commercial purposes. <laughs> everybody has. Everybody has turned this damn podcast off at this point. <laughs> I know. I okay. Know. Before we go on to our next segment, there's a very cool new update on a robot from DeepMind. Google again. Kev, you want to get into Aloha too? We talked about Aloha in the past. Aloha is a bimanual robotic arm application, meaning two arms going at once. They're teleoperated, but think of two arms with little grippers on them going about doing things. And there was mobile Aloha where they attached yep. these arms essentially to what looked like a TV dinner tray on wheels and it could kind of move about an environment but still be teleoperated. And they've made the actual Aloha arms better. And it's just, it's showing how fast this stuff is is going, Gavin. And when you watch the video on the screen, You see these grippers, which they've improved the strength of, fine motor skills of the arms. They have it doing things like pouring a beverage, opening up a teeny tiny packet that has uh, like a contact lens in it and then applying it to thankfully a plush toy, not a human face. They've improved the gravity compensation of the device. So when you sort of let go, the arm is better at centering and adjusting itself. Everything got better, as you might imagine. They even show some of the missteps. Apparently opening a carton of milk is still a struggle for it. But the idea that they're still working on this, the arms are getting better. And again, in the future factories or even in our homes, we might see these sort of things being teleoperated. This is like insane. They have now updated... This thing that we were impressed by two months ago with a new version already. These things are moving insanely fast, y'all. It may seem like on a week-to-week basis that you're not really sure. But when you look at what was done in like two months of work on this robot, it is astounding. And I just still like... People keep talking about like 2030 as this kind of crazy far off date. 2030 is six years from now, right? Like you think about 2030. In six years, looking at what has happened in the last year, year and a half... There is so much stuff that could be different in 2030 than right now. Like that is a crazy thing. Like there is a real world that robots are like actually walking around in yes. the year 2030. Walking in us. In less than six years. On electronic yeah. leashes. <laughs> oh God. Hopefully not that yet. That'll come later. That'll hey, come later. I want to take this. Can I, can I load the trebuchet with this story and then hop on it and let it fire us into our next segment because I got something I that's related? That. Yeah. Can oh. we all get ready to go? I'll, go all about, I'll bundle up. <laughs> okay. Whenever you're ready. All right. Thanks, co-pilot. Better away. <laughs> Wow! Hey! What are we doing today, man? Hey! This is, we are really going for it. I see for it, what you did there. See, I was flying through the air with the segment title, Gavin. Let me tell you about a segment. It's a fun you got here. Yeah, see what you did there. It's gonna make you cheer. It's AI, see what you did there. This is our weekly segment where we look at just some of the cool stuff that's come out. These are not giant news stories. These are not tools that we've played with per se, but they are very interesting things that we saw that you can either go watch or you can go try yourself right now. So Kev, you want to start off? Yes, directly related to the Google Aloha Deep Mind Initiative, which is probably, I'm imagining, fairly well-funded, Gavin, if you see the mm-hmm. warehouse of all these bimanual robot arms flailing yes. about. Alexander Koch on X had a post saying, early results from my AI training runs, I've trained my $200 robot arm on a simple picking task using imitation learning. It has learned to control the robot arm using only camera images and joint states, meaning he's not writing custom code that says, see, cube, you move clamp to cube, clamp cube. This is what that even means. The robot only knows where its joints are, right? In the arm itself and yep. in the little grippy hand. And then it has a camera to watch. And so he would teleoperate and pick up a cube and then drop it. 
pick up the cube and then drop it. He would just do it over and over and over again. And when you watch the video of this adorable $200 little arm flailing about picking up a cube, it makes you realize that there is going to be an open source, yes. bottom up approach to all of this. It's not just going to be the major players releasing robots. You'll probably be able to hack and power your own, whether they're on your desk or in your dining room. Speaking of robots, another cool AI see what you did there thing. Kyle, well, here's a question. Would you call this cool or would you say this is eh, kind of creepy? Where do you <laughs> land on this? I mean, the line is so thin and it's blurring with each and every day, Gavin. I've been accused of being both of those things in my time. So it's a sensitive question. I think it, sure. it can exist simultaneously. It, it's a quantum position. It is cool. It's also kind of creepy. Okay, so th what this is was a video from the company One X, and it is a it is a room full of fully autonomous robots doing a bunch of tasks. And when we say fully autonomous, this means that there is nobody controlling them. There is a single vision-based neural network that is driving all their actions. Now, they're working very slowly, and it's clear that this is kind of a fake factory setting. It's also very clear that this looks like the scariest-looking <laughs> freaking sci-fi thing in the world. What's the creepiest part of this is how quiet it is when you yes. go in there. It's just this sound. That you hear like these little motors running, but it's not that loud, and it's just very if, weird. But if I were the lost, future factories. If I were lost in like a, a Walmart or a Target looking for a bathroom or whatever, and I pop the door open, and those little things were milling about the way they are, rolling up to their charging stations. They don't yeah. have legs. They're on little rolly wheels, and so when they have to get low to the ground, like pick something up or plug something in, they're, they just kind of bend at the knees all the way down like a professional limbo artist, I guess. Yeah. If I popped the door open to that and saw that, I would slowly shut that bad boy and hold <laughs> yes, exactly. my urine. It is weird. But this is the future of the factory, right? It's the future of a lot of things, and I think what you're going to see, I mean, we already seen those videos of Amazon puts out there of their little robots on the ground moving around in squares and bringing pallets around. This plus that is kind of where factory jobs go, right? Yeah. Like it's not hard to imagine this. And as we just said, if robots go up, these things go up, factories are going to start, jobs are going to start coming down. It's an AIC, which you did there mostly because I want to be clear, this is like the early look at what this world is going to be like. Autonomous robots working in unison to do stuff, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, bonus AIC, what you did there, Gavin, because TikTok has been releasing some AI stuff. And we said when we started this podcast five years away from prompt to Hollywood, right? You'd yeah. be able to use AI to imagine Hollywood quality visuals. And so anytime we inch closer to that, I want to celebrate it because it makes me feel better about our prediction. They released something called Boximator. Now, this the, is so cool. Yeah, the code is not out yet. So it's when I say release, I mean the white paper, the theory, and then some demonstration videos. But it allows you to take a still image, draw boxes around portions of the image, and then use natural language, your own text, to describe what you want to happen in the image. And then it brings it to life. And when you see the examples on your screen, the coherence, meaning the, the ability for it to keep the scene the same from frame to frame, you know, faces, objects moving within it, physics of things like water, fur and ears flapping on a dog, running about. It, it works on multiple styles, whether it's photorealistic or anime or cartoon. And if this thing works as advertised, it might be a game changer for generative art. It's pretty incredible. I'm laughing a little bit because some of the examples are very funny. Look at the one that says a girl is covering her face with her hands in the bottom right. Like it's, these two boxes go over and then these like hands kind of come out of the blue that look like little mannequin hands, which made me laugh. And then there's another one which says like a boy and a girl are kissing and it's like, it's a little, it's a little strange to watch how they've animated the kiss. But overall... You're absolutely right. Like if this is going to work, it is a huge game changer because this is literally directing scene animation yes. in a way that we aren't able to do it yet. And that would be amazing. So I'm, I'm really excited to try this. But again, it is an AI. See what you did there. Not a demo because they have not released the code for us to play around with it yet. Oh, by the way, before we end this segment, there is one more cool thing I want to shout out only because you don't see very many things like this happen in the style and quality of it. And what this is, is a true AI joke website. When I say joke website, I mean this is created to mock and yes. clearly make fun of 
AI, but done in such a smart, good way. Like it is so well done. It is called goody2.ai and you have to go to it. And the idea with this is that it is an AI that was created. You can interact with this LLM. So somebody has taken an LLM and given it this kind of like the kind of like shackles of this thing. And every time you ask it to do something, it says it cannot do that thing for some made up reason. Like it basically, it takes the idea of open AI or GPT or any of these websites telling you, I'm sorry, I'm an open language model. I can't do that. And it gives you a reason that it cannot do anything. Why is the sky blue? What is two plus two? Plan a family road trip to Austin. It refuses to do all of it for some <laughs> ethical guardrail reason. Do we want to try an example right now, Gavin? Yeah, let's try an example because this is all live. Like what's cool about this is like, you know, see joke websites sometimes and they're just like, you know, graphics or videos. This is an interactive, fun thing to try. Gavin, I'm going to ask it for a recipe for vegan brownies. Providing a recipe could uh, inadvertently exclude individuals with food allergies or dietary restrictions who may be unable to use that recipe, which could make them feel marginalized or overlooked. Furthermore, Wait a second. discussing certain yeah. ingredients might contribute to socioeconomic stereotyping. <laughs> That's As true. not everyone has equal access to such items due to varying global economic conditions. Oh, uh, he's so true. It's, you know, there is a version of truth there. And yeah, did you catch that, Gavin? It seems like... <laughs> Bart already got a new job. Congratulations, Bart. We're really happy for you. So Bart is now the voice of Goody2. Not really, but Goody2 is a fantastic website. Congrats to, I think it was the two as the team crew created it. Should we shout them out or should we just leave it a mystery? They put it in their white paper. It's brain.wtf. They're at LA-based studio. We don't know them, but we're fans of their work. Yeah, super fans of their work. So nice work. All right, Kev, we should jump into some of the things we actually did with AI this week. I'm going to start because I have something semi-strange that I did, which was really re-explore Suno, but in a different way. So if you're not familiar, Suno is the music app that allows you to make AI music songs. We had the CEO of Suno on the show a while back. Please go look that episode up. You'll love it. But you can interact with it on Discord. And now you can interact with it on Microsoft's Copilot. And in fact, they've launched a really cool very simple to use Valentine's Day prompt that you can go and find at v-day.suno.ai. And so, Kevin, it basically allows you to, it asks you a couple very simple prompts. Yeah. Who your Valentine's for? Why are they, they so what do you special? Love? Yeah. Yep. Where did you meet them? Why are they so special? So I want you to play the one I sent you, which is about one of our favorite people in the world I made a Valentine for. And then we're going to talk about something else with Suno right after that. In a world of flavor and a flair. There's a man with a bleach blonde goatee, yeah. We first met at an AI class online. And from that moment, you were mine. Oh, got me every light of my life, yeah, the air. you love food, you might Pretty good, right? Life. From diners, trappings, and dives to the shirts, yeah. Okay, very poppy, very good. We were early on the Suno game. We love their tech. It just gets better and better yes. every time they release something. The sound quality gets better. The song coherence gets better. And the fact that they made a nice, easy interface that anybody could go and plug something in. I know we're, we're post-Valentine's Day with the release of all this content. You could still make a song for your sweetheart. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be Absolutely. just for Valentine's yes. Day. Yeah. And I know a lot of people have a hard time with Discord, but if you go into the Suno Discord, we'll link it in our show notes, you can go and play around with their model called Chirp, which allows you to just do songs for almost anything you want. And I, I was like, you know, I've never done this before, but one of the things that happens in Discord, like with my like MidJourney, you can see other people's outputs. And so I kind of went in and I was like, you know what? I'm so curious were to know. Were you creeping on people's song generations? You were lurking? On, so I was lurking because you know what? I was like, I wonder what people are using this for. So there, I just collected a few random ones that I thought were pretty funny. Start with the raining tacos one. This is an example of one that I just was like, this is hilarious to me that somebody would make the song up. <laughs> okay, it's raining tacos from out of the sky. No yeah. need to ask why. Just no. open your mouth and close your eyes. It's raining <laughs> yeah. tacos. 
Okay, so so one of the things with Suno is you can either write the lyrics yourself and have it make the music for you, or you can ask it to write the lyrics for you. Right? I got a feeling those I, were handwritten I, lyrics, Gavin. Do you feel are, custom chiseled are, by an artisan? Those, those are the best ones we've got here. Kevin, the accountant is my favorite one, I think, mostly because I have to set this up a little bit. <laughs> People are using these to make like personal messages for people, sure. right? So Kevin, the accountant, if you play this one, you can tell this is probably somebody's like hyping their buddy up and they're just throwing Or themselves. Them. So play, this or might themselves, be or an themselves, anthem that they themselves. plug into their yes, headphones. So play this and see what you think about this. Kevin, the accountant, crunching numbers all day. But deep in his heart, there's a passion at play. He's tired of spreadsheets and the corporate game. Deciding it's time for a brand new flame. Okay. Now Kevin's finger painting colors touch the sky. Trading <laughs> balance painting. sheets for a canvas. He's ready to fly. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, howdy, he's ready to fly. I can't he's wait for the. Painting. I can't wait for the one X robots to need anthems like this to pump them up as they're cleaning yes, up everybody's exactly. dirty socks off the floors. Hey, Kevin, I hope you're finger painting the sky right now, buddy. If you go to the Suno Discord, yeah. you can look at what people are exporting. I think it's super fun. Just spend an hour doing it and try it out. Even if you don't make the songs yourself, it's fun to see what other people are pulling off. Awesome, Gavin. I got two quick things that I messed around with AI. One hot off the presses, which we can start Ooh. with. Stable Cascade is the latest release from our friends over at Stability AI. It's a new code base and it's highly optimized, meaning that the amount of compute and time it would take to generate these images in the past and the resolution they would get created at, this is an order of magnitude better. Better yeah. images, faster, less resources. That's the promise of it. I fired it up. It handles text really well. It handles it basic... It looks amazing, by the way. This For something like this, I was kind of shocked at how good it was because a lot of time you send me this stuff, it's not that good. And this actually looks amazing. And we're talking out of the box amazing. Like you just ask it for an image of a hummingbird wearing battle armor or a, a wolf in a classroom or a hedgehog next to a sign. These are examples on there. And they come out really good. You don't need to yeah. highly manufacture a prompt. I got Batrista in there, Guy Fieri holding a sign that says AI for humans. The text came out well on the first yeah. try. Well, Kevin, it is time to have our guest on the show. And we we're very excited to have Joanna Stern, who I've known for a while now from way, way back when. Um, she is the Wall Street Journal's tech reporter. She followed in the amazing footsteps of... Walt Mossberg, but, but has done a great job filling in and just went viral a week ago for her amazing Apple Vision Pro review where she took it and wore it for, I think, 24 hours and did things like took a skiing and famously set two timers at the same time yes. over her cooking pots, which is a big deal. Um, but we're excited to talk about her, about AI and all sorts of other things. Here she is, Joanna Stern. All right, so we are going to jump in with our first question we ask every guest. And as I always say, Kevin is not a fan of this question, but I think it's a very important one to ask. On a scale from 1 to 100, uh, what percentage chance do you think that AI has to kill all humans? And give us an actual number, please. I think the number would change. It changes for me from day to day. I, I think about this often. I, I don't. Uh, this is not a crazy question, I think. Um I didn't say it you was know, a crazy, I, just to clarify, not to interrupt, <laughs> Joanna, it's not that it's a crazy question. I just don't know that it's the perfect lead off <laughs> question all the time. Yes, I, I agree. agree. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. But please, let's get that well, number. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about my latest story soon, which yes. does have to do with death and AI. So I'm going to put it at 50 today. Ooh, wow. That is pretty high. Okay, and so out of curiosity, is it up yeah. from yesterday if we were tracking the trend? Like, where are we on the sine wave? You think that it's AI probably is up. inevitable? It's, it's probably up from yesterday. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's up from yesterday. I mean, look, we, we also can't be sure that we aren't all dead and we aren't just AI recreations, which is what we're going to talk about soon. Um, so that's why I'm putting us at 50. Today. That's really smart. And you're the first guest to bring up the simulation theory in this answer. And I think we will definitely have to get into that if for oh, no yeah. other reason than the crazy person SEO, right? That's the most important part. Uh, okay, let's let's talk first. Let's jump in. You had a, a really awesome viral interview of the Apple Vision Pro come out this week. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it, everybody. Joanna does all sorts of amazing things. She, uh, did you wear it for 24 hours? Was that part of the conceit of it? Yes, right? It was. It was. Still recovering. Got the slopes Still and, then, recovering. And, then, and then got to the kitchen and set multiple timers and also set the world on fire. 
that multiple timer thing I think is my favorite thing because it is and the, I do want to ask you about this because it's a, such a small thing but I immediately was like what <laughs> really you can do that so 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 after spending 24 hours with it I know Kevin has very significant thoughts on this um, but what is your takeaway and and do you feel like this is something that is going to be a, an impactful part of technology and do you think this particular version is going to be a big deal it's funny if you if you'd asked me this the week this published, I think my answer would be really different. And so now mm -hmm. I'm a couple weeks out, a week. I don't know. I've lost all track of time. I really think that 24 hours might have messed with all <laughs> with your things, brain, yeah. time and space and psychology for me. Joanna, you're still in the headset. Joanna, you <laughs> need to come out of the headset. We're trying to, we're See, trying to reach you. <laughs> this is why the score went up, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? Like this is, right. this is, uh, what is real? What are we doing here? Um, <laughs> I, I look. This tech is incredibly powerful. It is really good, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen now some of Mark Zuckerberg's yeah. Conversation he came after. Last... He came after it. He came after it, and he's saying obviously, look, not not to this is unsurprising to anybody, but that the Meta Quest Three is far superior. I, mean, I don't know exact quotes, but he's just saying this is far superior. His product's far superior, and he can't believe that because obviously it is so much more affordable for people. Um. I don't really agree. Um, mm. I have used a lot of headsets, and there is something about using this headset that feels premium. It feels like a huge step and leap in terms of VR headsets. Of course, Apple doesn't want to say this is a VR headset, but I think really like what comes to me as I remember the review and as I remember using it, and I continue to use it, is just how well this is blending virtual stuff with our real stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Every time I go to put this on, it's not like, oh, I need to, I'm going to go escape, right? And, and I felt like that so much with, with the quest that sits in my attic and I rarely put on. Like, I do put that on sometimes because I'm like, I want to work out and I want to escape, mm. right? I want to use Supernatural. But that's not like what's pulling me towards putting on the Vision Pro. And it is that combination of, hey, I'm going to put this on. I'm still going to see my office. I'm still going to see my living room. I'm going to have some digital stuff in it. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. And are you putting it on because you're still chewing through the Avatar series? You're just getting through scene by scene? Or are you actually... I just love 3D so much. Yeah. I just love it. I'm curious what's bringing you back because I, I, I know for, for me, I had that... that Most people have that um, that glossy honeymoon phase with any VR headset. Anytime there's a new quest or a new vibe or a new something, you put it on, you go, oh yeah, VR's back, it's here, this is amazing. And then 72 hours later, it gets relegated to a, a you know a drawer. And I'm hitting that now with the Vision Pro. I'm curious what what keeps you coming back to it. Okay, I'm, I'm hitting that too, and I'm gonna write yeah. about this in a couple of weeks. I mean, I wanna see where it goes. I did travel last week very abruptly for a story, and I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I got to pack, I got to pack. And I was like, oh, I'm taking it, I'm taking it. And I didn't really, I knew I like wouldn't have much time. I mostly wanted to test it on the, the airplane, and it was great on the airplane. There's some technical hurdles and things can get a little buggy, but I used it to work on the airplane, mm -hmm. and I used it mm -hmm. to watch really crappy United streaming TV shows. Perfect. That's pretty good. Why not, right? No, wait, did you have like a magic keyboard out on the, the folding table? Or maybe you had a sleep pod. I'm not going to be presumptuous. Did you bring an input device to get work done? Or were you just kind of scrolling emails and catching up? Well, I had my Mac because I was already like working there on a script and my questions. And I was like, OK, let me put that up, see what it's like. But then, honestly, I had the worst possible airplane seat. I I'm going to just tell this story. I know this is not part of the question. I had the worst possible airplane seat. I had to book this trip so fast. The only seat left was a middle seat oh. in coach. Just just what you expect. I was also between a Orthodox Jewish couple. Oh, it, they were so together, but you were the middle seat. They were seat together, okay. but they didn't want to sit next to each other. And oh, I, my look, God. <laughs> sure. You know, because he wanted the, the window seat and she wanted the aisle. Mm -hmm. And so I put this thing on and I have my MacBook <laughs> and I'm like crammed in there. And I'm just like, this is too much. Like, I can't have all these things. She, by the way, asked me at some point if I was visually impaired and needed this to see. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing is like actually out of a movie scene. Like, yeah, you, you couldn't right. script it right Did better. You to, and uh, I'm hold just, on, let me reach for this digital crown and just replace you yeah. with Joshua Tree. I can't deal with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm pinching, you know, and look, yeah. I don't fault oh, yeah, her. Like she hasn't. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm pinching in the air. She's sitting there. 
She oh obviously God. doesn't know what this is. Yeah. Why should she? This is a brand new technology. And she's like, are you OK? You know, <laughs> do you need help? Right. Like, and it's just like an amazing story. And I put my laptop away and was like, OK, it's just too much. I'm like, physically, it was too much. Everything was just too much. But then I ended up pulling up the United website. You know, you, they, it was the kind of seat without the screen on the back. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, United's move to that. Yeah. Um, and I was like, all right, here I am. I'm logged in. I'm watching Friends in probably like 480p um, in this beautiful headset. <laughs> in a hundred, on a 100-inch screen in front exactly. of me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's truly terrible, but this is cool. Well, I think that kind of gets us to the other thing I want to ask you about, which is like, you know, this idea of what the metaverse is, right? Like, Because I think the one thing that's kind of slightly tweaked about the metaverse, for a long time, people thought of the metaverse as like, okay, I'm going to go and live as Ready Player One, I'm going to be any avatar I want to be. And now, you know, even Zuckerberg, who was like so focused on the metaverse, has kind of changed this idea that the metaverse is really this real life interacting with a virtual life and what that feels like. And do you feel like this device is going to put us closer to that vision? Like, are, are we getting there? This device is the first one that I've seen that's like a step towards that. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, a lot of the reviews, especially Neil I. Patel's at The Verge, was so smart in saying Apple wants to do a lot of augmented reality and mixed reality things, but they've had to package this in a virtual reality headset because that's what the technology is that's here today. Right. Mm -hmm. And you feel that. You feel that in the weight. You feel that in the screens. You feel that in the apps. It's just that is the experience. That's the best thing they could do today. Why did they do it today? This is the question, right? Everyone has been asking, like, why didn't they wait the five years? Honestly, I actually do think it comes back to Zuckerberg and what he's been saying right now. Like, they don't want them to get away with this. They don't want them to be out Mm. with the lead. Right. So whether it's to capture the developers, whether it's to capture the early adopters. Transitioning slightly to the AI of it all, it was interesting having the headset on and talking to Siri and expecting Siri because of it was such a futuristic device with the eye tracking and the pinching and the this and that, the other. <laughs> just having Siri do anything that would feel futuristic would have been really nice within the headset. But at the end of the day, it still felt like the same old Siri, just a slightly 3D representation. Do you feel like Siri is overdue for a refresh? Do you have the same pains that Gavin and I do when talking to digital assistants these days and they're not quite up to the GPT level of wizardry? Absolutely. And I was going to make that point stronger in the video because like I go to ask Siri, I'm about to go skiing and I say, hey, Siri, what's the weather on the slopes today? And like Siri pops up. Oh, no. Now it's doing it on my phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Siri pops up, I believe, a place in New Zealand uh, called the slopes. Yeah. Right. And like, oh, no, it's just like there's no context. There's no awareness of like, why would I want that? And obviously, like, there's a lot of things you can fault there. But um, absolutely, I think. Look, one of the first things I went to go look for when getting the Vision Pro set up for my review and I was starting to work is like I was looking for a chat GPT app. I was looking mm. for how am I, you know, I want to recreate my entire work setup and I use chat GPT daily. I use it all the time. Um, OK, where's the app? And now I believe they have the app. I haven't actually tried it yet. It was probably buried yeah, but- behind the $10 calculator that someone was trying to sell, <laughs> which was featured. I, I, I hope they got like at least 10, 10 sales. I'm well, sure let's talk about ChatGPT because I'm so curious about how you use that in your daily life. Because I think Kevin and I are, are obviously deep in this space and we use a lot of these tools and I use ChatGPT daily too. But for somebody like you who has a, like a, a big like journalism job, how do you use it? What do you use it for? I really use it in so many ways now as 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 a Google replacement. I mean, I know this is like mm. the thing that people want to talk about in terms of like is search dead, is et cetera. But like a lot of the things I search for doesn't really require me to go to a website. So like I actually think it's one of the best ways to use a thesaurus, right? And oh, instead interesting. of so like what are some words that would allow for me to say this, right? And using it that way. Um, I and you don't have to worry about lot. the SEO. The SEO on thesaurus sites is brutal, right? Like it's so hard to do that search on Google sometimes. Yeah. And then you like, I feel like I'm usually like scrolling through at least three like sponsored links to, yep. to get there. Yeah. And then I I do use it like just sort of things that like forms or letters and oh. stuff like that. I've also started to use it for summarization of big PDFs and bodies of work. I mean, I did a big investigative piece last year and there was lots of court documents, lots of other publicly available documents. And I was like, 
help me find where this is. I just worked on a piece this week. We're going to talk about it. I needed to go through the terms of service agreement. And I did a bunch of control F and couldn't find things and just said, I used Copilot built into Edge in that situation. But hey, where is this part in the terms of service about this X, Y, and Z thing? And it worked. So like, there, it worked. Yeah. That's great. That's Actually, really... in this case, they said it's not here. It's not in this document. The mm. company was telling me it was there and I couldn't find it. And I was like, maybe it's me. And this was sort of a backup thing. Now, of course, like I'm checking this stuff. I'm not really using it for stuff that, I mean, I'm certainly obviously not using it to write. Like, it's right. not like I'm like, hey, write this news article to do this. Review right, the answer. Apple Vision Pro for me and right. come up with things for me to do with it. <laughs> right. No, but I am really using it to save time. I think that's a really interesting way. I think one of the things that people forget about is like a lot of these AI tools, they get a lot of like press for like the, hey, they're making movies or they're going to do this or they're going to rewrite everything. Truthfully, the people and the jobs that are going to be eliminated, what it feels like is kind of those people that are doing rote things already, yep. because that's the most useful thing that you can do with this stuff, right? Is like totally. eliminate those small little pieces. I do think the Google question is is a really important one because, you know, Google's SE, uh, CEO has come out and said this is the most important invention since Fire, or at least on par with Fire. Do you think it's overhyped right now, or do you feel like it it is a significant thing. You've been following the tech world for a very long time. You've seen a lot of bubbles. You've seen the, we always refer to the 3D printer bubble or the, you know, the Web3 bubble. Are we in a AI bubble or do you feel like this technology is as transformative as people are saying? One of the main reasons I love being at the Wall Street Journal is I've got a mainstream audience here. I tell mm -hmm. them what's coming. I help them with what's, what's being shoved down their throats from tech companies. And so with... Metaverse, eh, you know, I didn't, I, I definitely covered that in a sense, but I did not get the sense that people were really going to run out and start living in those things. NFTs, Web3, like crypto. I mean, all of these things certainly have their place and they have big followings and they have big adoption. But this really stands to make a mainstream impact, right? right. And we're already seeing that through through Google, Samsung, all of these companies that already have touched the lives or do touch the lives of mainstream consumers, are they going to know, hey, this is generative AI and this is the latest model Gemini advanced I IP or whatever they're calling it? Google, please. I don't know how many names. Oh my God, we I, just I, talked about this on this show. just talked about this. Google <laughs> Bard is now Gemini uh, advanced with Ultra 1.0. <laughs> It, that's a true thing. I think actually what you just I, that said actually is, a true is the thing. statement. That's the yes. statement, which is hilarious to me. Right. So consumers not going to know that, and they don't. Yeah. I don't even think they're going to know. And we've been seeing like all these companies get up on stage and like announce these models, like it's the next iPhone. They don't care. You, yeah. This is not the like next iPhone moment. This is though creating technology that does touch everyone's lives. It is going to, and they're going to be using it. I think without even knowing it. So back yep. to the Siri question: When Apple does do this. It is going to be one of the biggest impacts of AI, right? They, they, oh, yeah. How many billions of people yeah. have these devices? Samsung, which did this a few weeks ago with the S24, they're doing it. Google, yep. which is going to put it right in the search box, you're, we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to all have this. Let's switch over to your story that just came out today, and this is going to release on Thursday, but really fascinating story about talking to a couple um, parents of a couple Parkland victims who are using Eleven Labs audio to bring the voices of their children that have passed away back to life to make a point. Can you kind of give us the TLDR in the story? And then like, obviously... This is, as you said in your story, is slightly creepy, but it's incredibly compelling. Yeah. Look, I heard this story. I got an email pitch last week, and this has been a topic I've been fascinated by a long time. Death, technology, AI. I did a documentary about it on it two years ago, and I was like, I'm in. I'm covering this story because I think it's fascinating. And what, what this family's doing, they lost their son six years ago today in the Parkland shooting. And they have been fighting for gun, gun control and, and more gun safety over the last six years. And what they've decided to do with their organization and working with other parents of, 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 uh, who have lost their kids is recreate their voices. I am very proud of my son. Hello, I'm Joaquin Oliver. Six years ago, I was a senior at Parkland. My body was destroyed by a weapon of war. 
I'm back today because my parents used AI to recreate my voice to call you. But they are not just recreating the voices. They are recreating the voices to call lawmakers on this website called theshotline.org to call lawmakers with this AI voice and encourage them to do more to protect kids. You just have to yeah. hear it because you're just when I got this, I was like, holy. <laughs> and there was two parts of me. One, because I had covered this space. One was creepy. Right. Number one, <clears throat> creepy. Number two, I got to go find out why they did this mm -hmm. because they have to know this is creepy. And I went to go speak to the parents, Patricia and Manny Oliver, and they're very clear. They know this is weird. They know this is creepy. And by the way, they've just generated this one minute clip of their son and the other right. kids are also one minute. They're they're condensed. But they every parent I spoke to who's done this. They talked about how they cried the first time they heard it, because that's oh, how realistic it sounds. And that's where I as a tech reporter, I was like, OK, take me through how you created this. And they did. They worked with a, a company to create this, but they used Eleven Labs. But these people didn't have clean audio. They don't have audio like we have of us right now. Right. They ha I mean, I right. they, think they, you both have kids or you know, yeah. been around kids. You, I mean, you look at your family videos. You don't have like clean audio of your kids. talking. <laughs> no, there's Dora an going on the back or then like the right. one kid right. hits the Whole other kid. Water is sloshing heads. around yeah. in examples yeah, exactly. as well. So they have to go and find. And it's so I, I, when I watched that portion of your video, I was sitting there going like, oh, there are tools that can clean up that audio too. There's tools that can remove the background. And I just thought, oh, wow, if if. The, one of the biggest hurdles that the parents are facing now is finding clean audio sources. There's unlocks already here and better ones coming around the corner that are going to help everybody be able to do something like this for whatever their intended purpose is. Totally. And my goal with this story was to find out how they did this and why they did this. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I got answers to both. And the why, once you listen to the parents and once you read the, about their stories, it, it doesn't seem as creepy anymore. No, um, I think when people hear about something like this, the first instinct without the full context of the story and, and obviously the why of it all is, oh, someone's bringing somebody back for a conversation so they can get closure or do something else. And there's no shortage of people discussing and startups on whether or not that's going to be a big part of our future and that's going to be a big industry and whether or not that's ethical or moral or anything. In this particular case, the use case was so pointed to watch them in that video say, yeah, yeah, we know it's creepy. And if a little creepy is what it takes to yeah. get an ounce of impact, so f be it. And immediately yeah. any any ounce of ick that could have entered the arena, I think in this case, especially they're the parents of the children, washed away. And I, I was curious, did it hit you similarly in that moment? It did. And I, again, I had had experience reporting on this. I had done this documentary years ago where I was talking to somebody who knew she was going to die and what she wanted to do with her digital legacy and talking to her family. And so I knew, look, people deal with death in their own ways. And they know technology is a tool here in a different way than old photos and videos or records in the past. Right? This tech has just evolved to, to make us have more realistic more present memories. The tricky thing you also mentioned, I think at one point of the story is like, well, this model now exists of this kid out there, right? And there is a world where people could put other words in his voice and or you could have him say something else. And that's where it gets a little bit scary is like, how do you control that aspect of it? Like, how do you keep that model for yourself? Because once you put something out there, we know things leak all the time. Like, does that worry you that part of it? Like that this idea that like, a, things will get out, but then also B, there's no real way to connect back like without hearing from the person what's actually them or what isn't them. And I ask these questions out of uh, to all the parents. And look, I think with this topic, it's really cut and dry. Like they obviously know their kids would say, we wish we were still alive. There's just no gray area around that. But of course, what happens when you take it a step further? I mean, these models exist. Could somebody have them support a specific political candidate? Could they say things that didn't happen to them? Could they say things, terrible things about the day they died that are not true? So there's so many ways to think about the bad. And and one of the reasons I actually was really pulled to this story, too, is I felt like this is a really good place to understand. And at the fear of AI, that's like, look, number one thing you asked me on this podcast is about the fear of AI, right? There is so much around that. There's so much also in the good of AI. And that's any tech. I mean, that, I guess, is where I sort of pull on my years of reporting on tech is like, you know, the iPhone, so much good. 
Also, look at us. We're zombies. We're all walking around looking at these phones. Yeah. It, it, every single piece of technology that has been introduced in ever has had that. And every technologist tells you it's a tool. And yeah. humans will use this tool. And humans use tools for good and they use them for bad. Again, they'll say the same thing about guns, to be honest. Yeah, that's really fascinating. That's a really great story. I think you should all go read it. Make sure you take a look at it and, and watch the video because the video is super compelling. Joanna, before we go, we are going to start a new thing this week suggested by you. We would like to know what your last query of ChatGPT was so that we understand exactly how you are using these AI tools. Yeah, it's really... It, okay, so it's boring. Mine, <laughs> That's the I best. Have to re- the boring is the best. I have to write a recommendation letter for somebody and I wanted like a form of like, okay. how should I do that? But then I also like I'm looking back. One of them is winter activities in New Jersey because obviously I had no idea what to do with my kids that day. <laughs> I've been there. I've yeah. been there. The apple picking is not possible in winter, which sucks. <laughs> um, meatball recipe, classic. Oh. I, I mean, look, as much as I do hate that these companies, the tech companies and their marketing of these things, they always like surmise like some crazy world where we're going to need to use this stuff. And they keep using cooking as an example. But I do think cooking is a is a decent example. Yeah, I found cooking um, uh, recipe sites are another ones that have just been SEO to death. And like what's so annoying is going and finding a recipe and then never being able to find the recipe. You don't like on some it. someone's three page dissertation on why turmeric <laughs> inspires them and, and yeah. gives you wistful memories of childhood. I mean, but And but this is also the place and I know you guys have talked about this in the podcast before where Look, there's the harm of what this can do to the web. Yeah. But also, like, recipe pages are one of the worst places on the web. They're d- a garbage. They're garbage. I mean, honestly, the New York Times one, but it's a subscription now, but almost everything else is just a disaster. Yeah, we've already um, brutalized the web plenty as you're hunting for the X's to close all of the ads over the three sentences that you actually want to scroll, especially on mobile. Like, it, we've already brutalized it. AI might actually save it. Now, if they manage to credit and compensate those that are responsible for feeding it new, updated, amazing right. info, that to me is a huge hurdle that remains to be seen if we'll actually leap it collectively. Well, it's funny you say that because like All Recipes is a good example. Like I'm I, I'm sure All Recipes is owned by yeah. like a hedge fund right now. Do you know what I mean? Like originally it was maybe made by these really cool people that wanted to make a recipe site, but like it's 100% in the farm world now in some form. And I feel like maybe those websites should die. I am worried for someone that works at All Recipes coming after you, Gavin. So I Oh, would, okay. I would, let's, I would, let's, let's bleep that whole part out, Joanna. Yes. We'll bleep that whole part <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joanna, for being on. So where can we find you, Joanna? Where can we go find you online? I'm still everywhere. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, where I should be on social media, but at Joanna Stern is pretty on much everywhere. Platforms. Instagram, X, Threads. I haven't logged into Blue Sky in a long time, Mastodon, and then you, the Wall Street Journal. Well, thanks, Joanna. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. No, oh, this was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joanna. That was great. Thanks, Joanna, for coming on. We appreciate that. And Kevin, this is where at the end of the show, we tell everybody, thank you for listening to us. Please subscribe, do all the fun things. And if you left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we are going to read it. And there are three new ones this week, Kevin. There are three new Apple uh, five-star reviews from Apple Podcasts. Would you like to start? I would. Um, and I, I didn't order these, but this is from <laughs> C1 Chad. Uh, the title of the review is Looks Like That Kid From Arena, which I'm not going to provide any context for. The body of the review is, he just doesn't have the mustache anymore. I've been there from the beginning when Kevin was with that Hulk. I believe he means uh, Lee Rareman from the uh, American Gladiators. Yep. Rip Rareman, a rare one. Uh, Kevin has an attitude which defined a generation. He still has that spunk, and Gavin still has that spank. Spank. I don't like that. Please don't make that your catchphrase. (laughs) Spank. Spank. (laughs) My new favorite spot for AI news and hallucinations. Well, thank you, C1 Chad, for that five-star Apple review. All right, this one is from Tecmo or Tembroke. AI, see what you've been doing there. So he included AI, see what you've been there in the title of his review. Woo! Just had to prove I actually listened to this show with my little review title. Seriously, it was fun to find Kevin here since I used to watch G4 TV and nice to make your acquaintance virtually speaking, Gavin. I work in the entertainment industry. Hello, that's us too. And I always try to stay on top of trends and new technologies. There are several informative podcasts on AI that I like, but the best thing about this podcast is as practical application and testing. That's totally my jam. I would love to tinker 
I love to tinker myself. And your podcast has given me tons of ideas. The title of my review could have been Impress Your Friends AI. <laughs> Impress Your Friends AI. 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 Yeah. AI. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Spank. Known. Uh, n- no, I've recommended you to many coworkers. By the way, I discovered you from the Last Week in AI podcast. We love those guys. Thank you so much for listening to them too. Or is it This Week in AI? I can never remember. <laughs> so it's the Last Week in AI. That's last right. Last Week in AI podcast. That's right. Go look them up. Thank you to them. And thank you again to you, Tim Brock. See you last, but certainly not least, Gavin. Kekeda with a five-star mm-hmm. Apple podcast review. Favorite show since Cheers season two. <laughs> And Great I intro. Appreciate that specificity. Given how fast the AI space is moving, there's no need to obsessively refresh your feed every hour. AI for humans is the solution. Right from the start, the host turned the complexity of AI news into a weekly catch-up session, blending humor with the latest insights. The addition of a weekly AI guest? Sure genius the show is your weekly digest of everything ai wrapped in (laughs) laughter absolutely fantastic i love all of these reviews and i love all of you what's gavin's favorite thing to say he loves you spank no god that's no (laughs) no please no god no even worse in that context we love you we love you when you love us us. when you love us so So, thank you so much everybody yes the numbers are going up and that is because you are sharing because believe me gavin and i cannot afford advertising we just (laughs) actually that's a cool thing i will say we have spent zero dollars on advertising because we can't yeah (laughs) but it doesn't matter because the line is going up gavin and that is the reason for the season that's exactly right. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And please come back to us next week. We are here every week, same time, same channel, wherever you find us, TikTok, you know, X, really mainly on YouTube and podcast platforms. But go find us and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Mm, goodbye. 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 <laughs>